This episode of Diary of a Wrestling Fan is dedicated to the memory of Joe Laurinaitis, known to wrestling fans around the world as Road Warrior Animal. It is now time for Diary of a Wrestling Fan with Bill Chase. And now, here he is, the man who convinced Haku to leave WCW in 2001, Bill Chase! Thank you, thank you, Mr. Podcast Announcer, and welcome to another episode of Diary of a Wrestling Fan, the podcast that chronicles my 33 amazing years of being a fan of the wonder that is professional wrestling. Thank you for listening on Spotify, on Anchor, wherever podcasts are streamed. If you're listening on YouTube, hit that subscribe button right now. Wherever else you're listening, follow, subscribe, whatever you got to do, just keep following the podcast and keep on listening. And thank you, thank you, thank you. My listenership has grown over the past few weeks quite significantly, and I can't thank you all enough for your support, for listening. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you all so much. But today I'm going to do a topic that, meh, I don't know if it's, uh, we're going to see how it does, if it's going to be intriguing to uh my listeners are not. Uh, it's a two-part series I'm doing on my tape trading days. But before we get to that, I want to give, of course, a quick plug to Pro Wrestling Ontario. Follow us on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Give us a follow. We are on Facebook. Give us a like. And, of course, we are on YouTube. And if you happen to be listening to this podcast on YouTube, scroll over the corner of the video. That's right, the upper right corner. There's a link to Pro Wrestling Ontario's YouTube channel. After you're done listening to the podcast, hit it, subscribe, watch the content. We got complete shows, both Iron Cup tournaments. We got the backstage shenanigans of Foundation and so much more. That's Pro Wrestling Ontario. All right, well, here we go on a journey known as tape trading. Now, for those of you who do not know, tape trading was very popular, especially in the 80s and 90s among a lot of the uh, wrestling fans, or, of course, who uh, what we call today uh, as the smart fans, you know, the, the dirt sheet readers, the fans on the inside. Me, I wasn't really, again, like I mentioned this before, I wasn't really a dirt sheet reader in my teen years. Again, I called this hotline, a free hotline, by the way, on the, on the Hamilton Spectator, for the Hamilton Spectator newspaper, and basically they would give me, like, some wrestling news. They can give you a little peek behind the curtain, but we wouldn't pull it all the way back. By 1998, and this is where this story truly takes off, this was the spring of 98. This was shortly after, uh, of course, I mentioned this on a previous podcast, I mentioned a couple times now, where I forged a report card, got severely punished, and rightfully so, I was an idiot. And so, a lot of my wrestling stuff was taken away. That being said, however, even though I wasn't supposed to be watching Raw or Nitro or any bit of wrestling, I was still watching things on television after my parents went to bed. So there you go. Uh, sorry, Mom, if you're listening. Again, sorry. But I, again, I th- I'm almost 100% sure you, are, you already knew that. But anyway, so I'm at the mall one day, and I've told this story before. Now, this is regarding my friend Mark, who I mentioned, of course, is the man I went with to those Toronto shows in 2001. Check that out in the archives. It's actually become my most listened to episode, or it's about to anyway. I think it's just only a one uh, stream behind my premiere episode, so there you go, which is still my, my number one, I think. I have to check again. But either way, I digress. So, I met Mark in a mall, randomly. Uh, he was wearing a really cool, I, I remember his Bret Hart t-shirt. I put him on it. And I was just at the food court with uh, my buddy John. Now, John had, what did he, oh yeah, he had to make a phone call or something like that to his mother or whatever. And I talked to Mark for a bit. And I was amazed how much this guy knew about wrestling. I thought I knew. And he says, I'm into tape trading. Do you know what that is? I said, I've heard about it. So tape trading, again, people would um, sometimes make posts in like stuff like The Observer or uh, other like publications. And then when the internet came out, they're making postings on like the infancy of message boards of tapes and compilations of matches, promotions, and, you know, even feud compilations or territories that people were seeking out. Then it, it, it got people familiar with things that they had been reading about in the aftermaths. 
Now, reading like stuff like Pro Wrestling Illustrated and whatnot growing up, I knew a bit about the territory. Territories yeah, easy for me to say. When Mark asked me, he said, "Do you know anything about the territories?" He actually asked me that, and I said, "A bit." I said, and I did. I knew the basic outline of it and what they represented, but I hadn't really seen much from them. I'd rented a couple of tapes from Jumbo Video of AWA. But really, that was as far as my territory experience went. And yes, I did rent some stuff from Crockett in the, you know, from the late 80s and whatnot, from the Jumbo Video store as well. But again, that's more, they were more of a national, more of a national product at that point. So I really, you know, I was familiar with some territories. He, he blew me away when he said, you know, Hogan used to be known as, uh, you know, uh, Terry Boulder, Sterling Golden. He wrestled uh, in Florida and in Memphis. And I said, oh, I said, no, I, and, and he was a heel. I'm like, I'd heard that, but I didn't know it was, I always thought that he just started in WWF and then went to AWA, which I knew about. I've seen his AWA stuff at that point. I think I watched, uh, might have been Super Sunday with him and Nick Bockwinkle. He said, yeah, he's like, no, Hogan used to be a bad guy on the territory. He's quite a bit. He used to heal. And that's just getting ter- familiar with terms of heel and babyface. It was thanks to Mark. And we were talking there for a good 20 minutes. I guess John, for whatever reason, didn't come back right away. And he's talking about Smoky Mountain, which I'd heard about. Again, I'd heard a lot about Smoky Mountain. I knew I knew Jim Cornette was a big uh, proponent behind it. I didn't know he was the promoter, and he actually told me that. Well, Jim Cornette, well, he ran it. I mean, really? So even at this point, I'd heard Cornette was a very smart guy when it came to uh, wrestling. So Mark said, you know, you should come by the apartments. And I know Mark was a few years older than I was. He was around college age at this point. And he... He told me, he said, do you, like he asked me, do you have an email? I said, no, I didn't have the internet at the time. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, well, he's like, do you have a phone number I can reach you at? He had a, well, he had a cell phone at that time. Again, the cell phones, they weren't exactly the brick phones at that point anymore, but they were like the, the big clip phones, though, and. Well, not, he had one of those, and uh, he saved my number. And he said, I'll give you a shout. And I, I didn't think I was going to hear from this guy again. Literally a day later, he calls me up. And he wants to say, hey, somebody named Mark. So I talk to, on the phone with him for a while. And he's going on about a lot of the stuff that he's putting together. He said, I'm making this compilation of Mid-Atlantic and Memphis wrestling. Now, again, Memphis, I knew Jerry Lawler. I said, oh, Memphis, that was Jerry Lawler. He's like, yeah, exactly. He's like, but, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet with this Memphis stuff. You thought, he's like, you remember Jimmy Hart? I'm like, oh, of course I know who Jimmy Hart is. Like, Duh. <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. He's like, you haven't seen Jimmy Hart like this. And I'm like, huh. Okay, so I'm wondering, he's, he's got my curiosity now. He also goes on to say, Mid-South Wrestling, Ted DiBiase was better here than he was as the Million Dollar Man. I'll say that right now. I'm like, really? Now, this guy was so enthusiastic that I was buying what he was selling. Almost literally. <laughs> so he said... He lives in an apartment. It was pretty far from where I live. We lived on Lawfield Drive at the time, which was on a mountain. He lived all the way down the mountain, pretty far away, near the East End area. And he had a girlfriend at the time. Now, I was talking to John about this, and John was weird. He's like, this guy's older than you, and he's inviting you to his apartment? That's kind of weird. And then I kind of thought about it. I was like, oh, Jim, John might be right. He said, what do your parents think? I'm like, ooh. And then, of course, because he said that, I'm like an idiot, I hid something else from them. Well, either way. It turned out all right. I didn't know Mark had a girlfriend either at that point. And so he calls me again and says, hey, do you want to come down today and check out the tapes? I'm like, sure. 
So I go down there. He picks me up, actually, because I, I, I told him, I, it's a pretty far bus ride. I don't know if I should ask my parents for a bus ride, because I don't think they were home at the time. And, and he's like, no, man, I'll come get you, because he drove. So I gave him my address. And again, I'm taking a risk here. I know. It's probably stupid of me to take that risk. But same time, though, I don't know. Wrestling got me curious. Thankfully, the risk paid off. Mark picked me up again all the whole way down. We're talking about wrestling. And I asked, we're talking about Unforgiven, which was coming up at that point, I think. And Austin being champion, he's like, I'm telling you, this whole thing with McMahon, dude, McMahon's going to be the best heel in this business. <laughs> and man, did he call that one at that time. Oh, did he ever. Um, he was also telling me, I remember he was telling me how Jericho, he thought Jericho was the future of professional wrestling. <laughs> you know, that is, I mean, the, the guy knew his shit. You know what I mean? He was, he was like me, a very devoted fan, but only... He was that much more devoted than I was. So I go to his apartment not knowing what to expect. I get in there. I see his girlfriend. She's sitting on the couch. She was very pleasant. She says, hello. When I say hello back, he's like, come on in here. And then he, he had, it's a three bedroom apartment he was living in. Yeah. I guess it was his and his girlfriend's bedroom and a guest room and his office. His office was just this. <laughs> Big, like, I don't want to say hoarding, but it's piles and piles of VHS tapes. Or I know he called it his editing suite, which is what we used to call the editing room in communications class, too. He's like, this is my editing suite. I see literally five or six VCRs in there, three TVs, and the room is pretty big. And you can tell he had a system. And I look in his closet in that room, and there was no door on it. I guess he took it off. And there was literally piles and piles of blank tapes. So he said he's working currently, and this is again what drew me in, an ECW compilation. And of course, if you listen to my ECW podcast in the archives, when I discovered it, and I think I mentioned this briefly on that too, is that they stopped airing hardcore TV on that station I got from Pennsylvania because I guess I'm just assuming it was because of the crucifixion angle with Salmon and Raven because it got uh, because it, it didn't air after that. I mean, I didn't see it personally, but again, I, I've got to put two and two together when I, when I heard about it and read about it and he showed me the angle and I'm just like, and again, I, I I think I'd seen part of it once before. Can't remember where, but he shows me a part of it. He shows me the whole, this time I see the whole thing, what led up to it. And he says, you know that Kurt Angle guy that was there? I'm like, yeah, the gold medal dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah, he fucking ruined it and, and everything. He, he moaned like a little bitch. This is what Mark was saying. Like, now apparently he might be coming to WWF. I don't know. <laughs> The market internet as well. Um, you could see that he was very passionate. In his living room, actually, there was a lot of old wrestling posters. I thought that was the coolest thing. Like, we're talking old event posters from, like, the Maple Leaf Gardens, um, the the, um, the Bear Man shows and that, and everything. Like, wow. Even stuff, like, from out west with Stampede, stuff from Georgia. Like, wow, where did he get this? And when I, yeah, so fun. I'm like, how do you afford all this? And at the time, he had a regular job. I believe he was uh, working. I can't remember. It was one of the one of the factories, one of the industrial places. But I guess he, well, the way he said it to me, and I would find this out years later, he was good at making investments. So that's how this income kept coming in, and of course, that's why he was doing so well in the tape trading scene. So. He's working on an ECW compilation, and I'm watching him put it together. And it's a lot of the stuff I had missed since it had aired. I watched the entire Raven Dreamer match, where Raven left the company to go to WCW. And then uh, that's when Lawler swelled up uh, Tommy Dreamer's testicle, and they did the, the WWF invasion. He called it a big disappointment, but he said people wanted it. 
So as he's putting this stuff together, so he, he looks at me, he's like, okay. He's like, so I obviously don't have time to show you all the stuff that I made. So he hands me a pile of five tapes. And they're all labeled. He said, okay. He said, these two are from Memphis. Then he said, next one, this is from a company called Continental. Like, okay. Then he said, the next one, this is from Mid-South Wrestling, and it's a compilation of the Junkyard Dog, Ted DiBiase feud. Like, oh, cool. And then he hands me the last one. He's like, this is a company called the UWF. They were shit, but it's entertaining because it was shit. I'm like, huh? It's called the UWF. It's run by a nutcase by the name of Herb Abrams. He died a couple years ago. And I remember now, and then this is I'm thinking UWF. I'm like I've seen it a couple times. I can't remember where, but I remember I seen a few shows. I'm thinking eh, this isn't really all that great. I think it was like eight or nine at the time. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll check it out. He's like, but there is one. There is a couple really good matches on it. So check it out. I'm like, okay. So at this time, my parents don't know where I am. <laughs> I think I left them a note saying I was at the mall with John. So I get back, and of course I'm hiding the tapes. Because again, I'm not allowed to watch wrestling. Now, the one thing that my parents didn't take away from me was my TV or my VCR, which I guess might have rendered things pointless. They took away almost everything else. Remember, I had no internet at the time and no cell phone, so there wasn't much they could take away, but I guess they just still felt the need to keep the, t keep the TV in my room and the VCR. So, through the week... I'm watching this Memphis stuff, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, Jerry Lawler was a really good wrestler, and I I never knew he was a babyface. They show the legendary Tupelo concession sand brawl. It's Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee, who, oddly enough, I recognize from his run as Sir William, uh, Lord Stephen Regal's manager in WCW, against... Larry Latham, and a fellow by the name of Wayne Ferris, who, of course, I recognize right away. That's the Honky Tom Man. <laughs> I'm thinking this stuff is great. I think the tape was labeled Memphis's Wackiest Angles. Or, yeah, what, sorry, it was, yeah, it was Wackiest Angles and Matches. Yeah, because there was a lot of matches on here. So I'm watching this stuff. And I was just blown away by how great it was. They showed stuff with Lawler getting run over by Eddie Gilbert. Yeah, this one wasn't I didn't have an organized timeline. I think it's just more of a, just a collection of stuff. But he at least included the famous cage match. Lawler and Dundee. Tommy Rich, who I knew a little bit about at the time, was at the bottom of the ring. The cage was surrounding the ring at the time, thinking that would still keep people out. I mean, we were under the ring the whole time, and it was the, the hair match. And man, the heat from the crowd. Like, listen to this crowd! I had a few crowds at this time were nuts. And they were. They were, especially compared to today. But man, alive, listen to these people. They're ready to riot. I think this stuff's so cool. Most of the stuff on this tape involved a lot of stuff with Lawler. Uh, even the match with. Him and Flair from the, the TV was on there. And I'm thinking, wow, I didn't know these two ever faced. So I'm just loving this stuff. I tried to show it to John he wasn't interested. And that's fine. That he wasn't interested in the old stuff. So as I'm watching this stuff, and again, seeing again, he included young Hulk Hogan. He included some stuff from the mo the modern USWA with uh Jeff Jarrett and young Brian Christopher. It was a really good long eight hour tape. So, it's, of course, it took me a while to watch. He's actually calling me and asking me how I'm enjoying them. I'm giving him my feedback. I'm thinking, you got to send me more of this stuff. So, even though I wasn't doing any tape trading myself, I was still intrigued by the whole concept of it. 
he mentioned a guy by the name of John McAdam, who was, of course, a famous tape trader for many years and now has the Stick to Wrestling podcast, which I highly recommend. And then I watched that tape. I watched the next Memphis tape he gave me was a compilation of Jimmy Hart and the First Family. And boy, was he right when I said I've never seen Jimmy Hart like this. I hated, hated Jimmy Hart for years because of how great of a heel he was. But man, was he ever despicable here. Watching him on these tapes, it was just ridiculously good. I can go into detail about a lot of this stuff, but man alive with the way this, it's already going to be two parts, it'll be five if I go into a lot of detail about some things. But I, I might just do a podcast devoted to tape trading, who knows? In my memories there, I could probably do a whole podcast reminiscing about some of the stuff that I watch. Already, I only watched the two Memphis tapes, and I'm just loving this whole thing. I think it is the best stuff that I've watched in, since, well, ever. I wanted to see more Memphis, but then I pop in some Mid-South. The Ted DiBiase-JYD feud. And again, I, I wasn't used to seeing Ted DiBiase clean-shaven. And the first part of the stage, of course, starts as with him as a baby face. He turns on the dog, and this compilation shows their whole feud... But he adds a little Easter egg app, like this this whole thing, when he shows DiBiase going face again for when he challenged Ric Flair when he's attacked by Dick Murdoch and bloodied up prior to the match. And DiBiase, like a valiant baby face, even though he shouldn't be fighting, still fought the match. So again, it was so good the way he put these tapes together. Uh, the next tape was, again, and again, I, I, I'd never seen JYD. I think JYD, is, I even said, wow, he's better in mid than he was in WF. Which... For a lot of people in terms of, you know, a lot of people, like diehard fans that have paid attention to both the territories and, you know, WWF, they feel that way. JYD was a star in WWF, don't get me wrong, he was actually a pretty big star for a couple of years, but man, was he off the charts in Mid-South. So, the next tape I watch is the Continental tape, and this, like, this is unbelievable. This was a show that was got a lot of exposure because of the the financial the financial news network. And it wasn't all of Continental. It was mainly during Eddie Gilbert's tenure as Booker, and he would tell me this because it's the, even the label of the tape said Continental slash Eddie Gilbert era. And him and again watching the stuff that again I watched an angle on YouTube which I completely forgotten about, which kind of sparked me wanting to do this episode. Uh, our, our local wrestler. Um, in Ontario here by the name of Jeff Black he posted this um, this angle with Dirty White Boy who'd been abusing his girlfriend apparently Dirty White Boy a fantastic just piece of shit southern heel he really was I'm watching his stuff I'm thinking he is an asshole and then there's Dr. Tom Pritchard who I only knew as a heel the heavenly bodies. And as a babyface, I'm like, well, he's really convincing. I actually want to get behind him here. And then they do this angle where white boy's girlfriend has a black eye. She's almost like begging for Tom's help. He's reluctant because I think he senses the trap, but sadly he's still trapped anyway. And white boy just viciously attacks him. He tears down the set. He hangs him. In the ring. And the crowd, again, they're rabid. Gordon Soli on commentary, just perfect. And again, I knew about Gordon Soli. Then I pop in the UWF tape. I'm watching this, thinking, what, what am I watching? I'm watching these guys who are, you know, great stars of the WWF for many years, and some of whom would become... Big stars like Mick Foley, who he was cact he had to run his cactus jack there. And there was actually a really good match with uh, Paul Orndorf and Bob Orton. And Herb Abrams uh feuding with Colonel Red. Watch the dark side of the ring of the UWF folks. I'm like Paul Mark after this game, like, what did you just have me watching? He's like, It's a great A. Eh? Like, no. <laughs> and he's like, Well, it's great from a train wreck standpoint. I'm like, oh you know what? After he said that, I'm like, Well, I couldn't take my eyes off it. I wasn't bored, that's for sure. 
And I really actually got into Wild Things Steve Ray. I really liked I actually became kind of a mark for him. <laughs> So yeah, this was a lot of fun stuff I'm watching. I'm like, you gotta send me more. And I'm like, when do you want me to bring these tapes back to you? I'm like, oh, dude, you can have them. That's what he says to me. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. I think he appreciated my knack for wrestling and my fandom. Because we could talk for hours on it. There'd be times we'd be on the phone. My parents never met Mark. I just said, oh, he's just a buddy of mine that likes wrestling. They didn't ask any more questions after I said that even though they didn't really want me watching wrestling, but they'd let me watch the odd thing here and there, even when I was still watching everything. Uh, he'd call me after pay-per-views, the ones I didn't watch at that time. Uh, he'd call me after and tell me what happened. So he was becoming a, a pretty good buddy at this point. And nobody knew I was going to his <laughs> apartment getting these tapes. So I said, I want more. I said, I want more of this stuff. He's like, okay. So again, the next batch of tapes he sends me. Smoky Mountain. Five VHS tapes of Smoky Mountain. And I'm watching this stuff. And again, I see Sunny, Tammy Sitch. And I'm thinking, again, she's even greater here. I'm like, I'm just thinking this as a fan. He might, I'm not what you'd call a smart fan at this point. And I'm like, she's really good here. Like, I'm enjoying her more here than I was in the WWF, even though she was gorgeous. And I, I would never look away from her. <laughs> Still, I mean, it was insane how great a character she was here. Right time, Brian Lee. And I recognized him right away as Chains. And I would find out later from Mark, he was the fake Undertaker. From 94. And I swear I binge watched these Smoky Mountain tapes. When I wasn't outside, because again, that the spring and summer of that year was beautiful in 98. But at night, it was these tapes. Watching Smoky Mountain, that became my favorite territory. Even though I had little exposure at this point to others. I mean, I loved Memphis. I loved Continental. I loved everything else. I loved the Mid-South stuff with JYD and... Uh, JYD and Ted DiBiase. I was... I see Jake Roberts. Smoky Mountain. I'm like, oh, I was wondering where he was between the times with WCW and then came back to the WF. And then he'd later tell me he had a run in Mexico. So guess what I told? I told him, I said, do you have anything from Mexico? He's like, oh yeah, I got tons of stuff in Mexico. And he gave me the When Worlds Collide pay-per-view. Now, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here because I still want to talk more about Smoky Mountain Wrestling. But again, I watched that When Worlds Collide. Oh my goodness, I was blown away. You don't get this stuff anywhere else. I think I've seen like clips of Luchador Wrestling on um, on the, the, like, the, the, like, the Artelamundo type station. Tell Latino, that's what it was. Yeah, tell Latino. But I never, for some reason, I guess I was never able to, like, I was always intrigued by it, but for, I guess maybe it was just the timing of it all. I guess I was watching something else, or maybe I had something else to do. I don't know. So with Smoky Mountain, I'm watching the gangsters, and I recognize them, of course, from ECW. And my jaw dropped when I see New Jack wearing an OJ Simpson jersey, praising OJ for the murders. Him calling out the N, uh, what's it called? Sorry, I got a little, almost tongue tied there. N, NAACP, which I knew a little bit about because of my parents. Because they told me a bit about it. Because, you know, I'd hear about it on documentaries and whatnot, but I'm thinking, wow. And I thought the stuff they did in ECW was nuts. Nothing compared to this. They're feeding with the Rock and Roll Express, who I knew a lot about, I actually knew quite a fair bit about. Thanks to the Crockett tapes I rented back in the day. And then I'm watching Cornette's feud with Brad, Ar or sorry, with, uh, with Bullet Bob Armstrong. I think this is really entertaining stuff. And again, I'm cheering for the, again, this stuff happened a few years prior. And I'm cheering for the Bullet to just beat that shit out of Cornette. 
I'm watching Bobby Blaze. He, I got into him. I got into him here as well. Tracy Smothers. If you were Tracy Smothers and a dirty white boy. Then the reluctant alliance later on when white boy went face. Again, white boy who, again, from Continental who I saw. I'm like, wow, he's so badass. So then I get some taste from Mexico. I see Conan with hair. One bullet. And his feud with uh, Piero Aguayo. And I'm thinking, wow, Conan was a star. The reactions he was getting. But nothing prepared me for the tape he made me from Puerto Rico. I'm watching guys like Carlos Colon, who I remember from the 93 Rumble. Abdullah the Butcher, who I've seen a lot of. Bursting through these crowds that look like they're ready to kill any heel that they hate. Guys like Bruce or Brody, and again, I knew that story, sadly. Uh, TNT, who of course was later known as Savio Vega. Ronnie Garvin. Buddy Landell, who I was somewhat familiar with. Kamala? Like, these are guys who are somewhat familiar with, but some I haven't seen before. Mike, I didn't know much about Mike Graham. I remember him as an enhancement guy in WCW. I was about it, so I'm thinking, okay. And there's some pretty cool stuff, too. Pretty insane. Uh, there was Dan Spivey, who I knew, a bit, I knew a bit. And I remember him as Waylon Mercy. I recognized him. And I'm like, man, the Puerto Rico stuff's psychotic. And it didn't end there. He gave me some stuff from uh, FMW in Japan. The famous uh, match, the fire match as well. With other, like Lots of Japan stuff with New Japan, All Japan. But the one that stood out, of course, the match where the building nearly went up in flames. The fire match. Now, yeah, it wasn't an FMW. It was Sabu, the Sheik, against Onida and Goto. And it barely lasted a few minutes, but man, I never forgot that image. He explained to me the backstory and everything, and my jaw just dropped. So as he's giving me more and more of these tastes, which again, I'm keeping. And he's letting me keep. I then get tapes from, of course, like I mentioned, Japan, so all Japan and New Japan. A, match, a great match with Hulk Hogan and Abdul the Butcher. Tenru and Hara versus the Funk Brothers. Billy Robinson. Ric Flair in Japan. Guys like Harley Race. Tiger G. Singh versus Antonio Inoki. Again, that rivalry was heated. And I knew about Singh because uh, growing up, well, my dad told me a lot about him. And I knew his son, Tiger Ali Singh, obviously, so that's why I knew a little bit about him. I'm like, wow. And as a joke, I said, I'm like, it's obvious where all the talent in that family went. <laughs> oh, God. So bad, I know. And, of course, the Masawa Jumbo Saruta feud. Now, this right here, this right here is what made me appreciate Japanese wrestling all the more. The story of the rivalry of these two just built on sheer competition. It was the last great rivalry Saruta had before, it, sadly, his injuries and his health caught up with him. Because even uh, he had told me that Saruta was was dwindling. And a couple years later, he uh, sadly passed away. But watching this stuff drew me in even more to the appreciation of Japanese wrestling. And then there was... Jushin Liger. Again, I knew who Jushin Liger was, but only from WCW, and I knew he was a star in Japan because I'd read about him in the magazines. But I'm watching Liger, who who had already blown me away with, with his match with Brian Pillman, and suddenly I'm watching matches with him and Owen Hart. I'm like, what?
And then I watched this amazing match, a very one that gets overlooked. It was from, I think, 92, him and El Samurai. Him and Hayabusa. Him and Muda. There was a great one with him and Ultimo Dragon. A couple of Ultimo Dragon matches. Oh, I'm like, wow, he's even better than I thought. I, I knew he was good already because of the stuff he did with Pillman, but not this good. So I'm collecting all these tapes, and I'm wondering, what should I do with them? And he said, you, you make copies of them if you want. Send them to your friends. And I started actually, so, okay, so I didn't want my parents to know I was doing this. I, when they weren't home, I'd unplug my VCR, I'd take it downstairs where their VCR is, and do the dubs. Because I had bought, like, just they were dollar store tapes that weren't the good stuff. I wasn't making the kind of money <laughs> that, uh, that Mark was. But uh, I made a few, gave a few away, but I was not good at tape trading. <laughs> See, this I was at a tape trading memories. It's the tapes that I had received, and it's all thanks to one guy. So maybe I'm overstating the title a bit, but again, that's what he did. Mark was a great tape trader. And so he had just, he called me up and he said, hey, this is now, this we're, now we're more deeper into the summer here. He's like, I got some more stuff that I'm putting together. Now he, I, he had went away for a couple of weeks, so I was kind of without material. So it was kind of sad. <laughs> but he said, I'm working on some stuff here from like the independent scene uh, in the early 90s. I said, oh, that's cool. I said, oh, who's on there on that? And then he's like, oh, I'll, I'll make you this series of matches with Cactus Jack and Eddie Gilbert. They got Sapu and the Lightning Kid, who I knew was uh, X-Pac, 123 Kid. I'm like, no way. He's like, oh, dude, that stuff's off the charts. I need some stuff with Jerry Lynn and the Lightning Kid. Uh, some stuff from Joel Goodhart's TWA promotions. This was some amazing stuff he was putting together for me. And I watched the match with Sabu and the kid. And I'm thinking to myself, well, Sabu, no, I think it was Sabu. I thought he was, had a cool character. I thought some of the stuff he did in the ring was really great. But man, was he ever awesome at this point. Like I like to stuff more here than a lot of stuff I, I did that he did in ECW. And the Eddie Gilbert Cactus Jack matches, I'm like, oh my goodness. And I, I got more intrigued by Eddie Gilbert. I was becoming fans of these wrestlers that I had always heard about or appreciating wrestlers that I already knew about and there's already fans of even more. Then I get compilations of the Midnight Rockers in the AWA. Of course, that's Sean and Marty. Of course, I knew all about them. Or so I thought. And the good stuff just kept coming. And I was almost overwhelmed. You know what I mean? I was almost overwhelmed. But I was appreciating everything he was doing for me. This era made me appreciate the history of wrestling. Those who know me nowadays know how much I appreciate the history, how much I love the old, older stuff. It was Mark that did it. He was the guy that got me into this stuff. It's him I had to thank for the fact that I've got to enjoy so much wrestling. And I still get to watch some of it on the network. Some of the stuff that he didn't get to put together for me. He did make me a compilation of Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat matches, which, oh my God, I love it. There's even one rare match they had from Japan on there. He somehow found it and put it on there. He also made a tape, a compilation of the Ric Flair Terry Funk feud. Now, again, I've seen some of the stuff rented the Crockett tapes. But I don't think I truly appreciate it until I watched it now. I'm a little older at this point. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm starting to love Flair a little more here. Now, this is around the time I mentioned this on my, on my uh, 
on my uh, uh, Fall Brawl podcast, from again, in the archives from a couple weeks ago. That, you know, I, again, I was right into Flair when he made that comeback in September of 98, when he made that infamous return on Nitro. But it's because of these tapes, I was even more intrigued by him at this point. He had made me some tapes of Georgia Championship Wrestling. Uh, the Ole Anderson, Dusty Rose feud, but okay. This trip down memory lane, I know, has been kind of scattered a lot as I put pieces together, but I do have to mention this. The first Florida compilation he gave me, first championship wrestling from Florida compilation he had given me was all of the Kevin Sullivan Army of, of Darkness. And I'm like, I never liked Sullivan, even as a both as a heel. And I just I never cared wa watching him really. Sullivan just didn't do it for me as a fan. I I hated him because he was a heel, but like otherwise there was nothing much to it. And I'm thinking, okay. And I even said to Mark, I did not, I didn't see the big deal about Kevin Sullivan. Did not see the big deal about Kevin Sullivan at all until this tape. They threw the fireball at Dusty. The introduction of Purple Haze, Maniac Mark Lewin. The vignettes were just... Oh, I'm thinking, this is in the 80s. This is long before The Undertaker and the ministry. Hell, even though as I'm watching these, the ministry was still a few months away. And I thought to myself, as I'm getting older, I feel as a wrestling fan, I should appreciate this, this other stuff. I should appreciate these guys. I, I, I'm, I'm only seeing what I'm seeing on television. And I'm talking to John and Jeff, my buddy Jeff Taylor, about this every week, and they didn't seem to care. And that's not even, that's their preference. That's their preference. And even more so, I think one of the last things he did before he took a break, which I'll get to, this is again, this is around now the fall of 98. Now this is around my line after the breakdown pay-per-view. Again, in the archives, folks, last week's episode. He gives me uh, tapes of Stampede Wrestling and Al Tonko's All-Star Wrestling. This is what he, he said to me. He so I'm at his apartment, and he looks at me and he says, "Bill, I have the Holy Grail." He hands me Stampede Wrestling. I knew all about Stampede, but never seen a minute of it. He's like, "There's a match here with Bret Hart and the Dynamite Kid." It's going to knock your socks off. And I couldn't wait to watch it. The Stampede compilation included some of their best stuff, including the famous promo with the Stomper after Bad News Allen attacked uh, his son. Matches with Brett and Dynamite, and they were off the charts. But it showed how far how far along Brett had really come. But even back then, he showed a, a Great knack for storytelling in the ring. And again, Brett was already my favorite wrestler at this point. And I'm thinking to myself, I barely knew about his past. This guy's my all-time favorite wrestler. And there's a whole other portion of his career that I didn't I knew about. But never really appreciated or never seen even to appreciate. I had a big smile on my face watching Brett in these old Stampede matches. And then one of the other Stampede tapes I got was the late 80s with Brian Pillman and Bruce Hart teaming up. Uh, Zodiac. 
which was actually later found to be Barry O, Barry Orton. Jason the Terrible, which I thought was a great character. Really young Chris Benoit. And his feuds with Gama Singh. Uh, Malkin Singh, who would later be uh, Bastion Booger. <laughs> and then, yeah, his great big man versus small man match with Owen Hart. And I have to say, Ed Whalen's commentary, some call it cheesy, and at times it was, but again, not boring. And I, he definitely still knew how to draw people into the match, so I got to give him that. It's hit or miss. Granted, it was seen a hit or miss. That was the all-star wrestling stuff. Oh my god, was it ever. There was some stuff on that tape I thought was really good. And then some stuff on that tape I thought was really, really bad. And th then there were some that were kind of in between. I, I might be getting a little shaky here, but I'll try my best if I can remember. It it was um, Tomko himself, Al Tomko himself, uh, and J.R. Foley, who, of course, was a, a great heel in Stampede Wrestling for many years. Uh, Tomko shows up on TV. I think he's wearing, like, um, a, a, a bowler hat and whatnot. And Tomko renamed, uh, sorry, JR came out to the stage. Yeah, I'm going all over the place here. So JR fully came out and he was, uh, and he knighted Al Tomko, naming him Sir Aloysius or something like that. Aloysius, sir. I can't remember Tomko. And it was a really cheesy yet really intriguing uh, segment. And then he would then dump Foley, attack him, and uh, Foley's son would make the save. But again, Sir Aloysius, Aloysius, Aloysius <laughs> Tomko. <laughs> Uh, beat, beat him down. Now, the, the thing is, too, is that about this promotion was that, well, that's when the angles were actually really good, but the matches just did not click for me. I don't know what it was. It was just the style. And Gene Kaniski, who was, again, a like god in this territory, I heard all these great things about him, but again, I needed to realize here that he was at the tail end of his career, was kind of eh. But sorry, I had a technical difficulty there. But I would learn later that this territory did a lot for younger guys. And I even seen some stuff of the honky tonk man here, Dr. D. David Schultz. So that stuff really caught my attention. So as, as wacky as some of the stuff would be with All Star Wrestling, yeah, it served its purpose. I still enjoyed it. So I. Uh, Wanted to request some more stuff. But here's the problem. Mark had told me that I guess someone who didn't really like him or was not, I guess, a fan of his personally had tried to report him for breaking copyright laws. Now, nothing happened to Mark. And for a guy who was pretty fearless, he stopped his operation right away. He gave me one last tape. And it was the, one of the ones I requested. It was of stuff from the Tunney Territory. In Ontario. And he said to me, he was all apologetic, thought I was never going to talk to him again almost. He's like, oh, dude, he's like, you're a great guy. I'm sorry I can't give you more tips. Like, dude, it's okay. I get it. Like, yeah, I literally had to move all my stuff to storage. He said, I'm going to do it again. But just I'm going to lay low for a while. 
He's like, no, it's okay. He's like, no, I know. I was trying to make you some more ECW stuff. And I said, dude, it's okay. Like, this is in yeah, late 98, almost 99. And he said, if you miss any pay-per-views, I'll take those for you still. But at this point, my parents will let me watch all the pay-per-views again anyway, so. Yeah. I said, no, I appreciate everything you've done. And I stayed in contact with him. Because he's my buddy. Thanks to him, I now know so many different avenues of wrestling. And I learned to appreciate them. And that's going to end part one. Great creating memories. Oh, no, yes. Mark would be back. He would lay low for a little while. I uh, went through, sadly, a bad spell with his girlfriend where he sunk into a deep depression, which he pretty much was a hermit in his apartment for like some six, seven months. I still heard from him here and there. I would find out later all he did was go to work and go home. And just, he would still watch wrestling. And I think not being able to make these tapes and not doing some of the things he loved, it hurt him. I think that I could sense the tension with him and his girlfriend, and it had nothing to do with his wrestling fandom. I could, she was a fan too, actually. I think it's because they had already been together for a while at that point. He had intended on marrying her. He really sunk low. To the point where you know, they would eventually get back together after many, many, many months, almost a year. But man, I don't want to get into his personal stuff, but it was very tumultuous and it sadly made him to be such so sad. And I felt sorry for him because he was a good guy. He still is a good guy, even though I don't hear from him much. He's not living in Hamilton anymore, but, and he's, you know, he still likes wrestling, but he's not, he's not doing a lot of the things as devoted as he was to it before, as he's pursued other projects. But I'm jumping the gun way ahead here because, yes, he would be back. And uh, thanks to him, once again, he'd introduced me to a man who'd become one of my all time favorite wrestlers. And that'll be on part two of Tape Trading Memories. Hope you enjoyed this. I know it was a little scattered. Maybe not my strongest episode. I'll even go as far to admit that. But still, I just wanted to give a little, give you all a little idea of how I came to love old wrestling. And it was because of him. That's going to do it for this week. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, BillChase33 on both. Uh, you can um, add me on Facebook. I'll talk wrestling with you, whatever. Uh, again, I love talking wrestling. Uh, also, keep listening to the podcast. Subscribe, follow it. Again, if you're here on YouTube listening, hit that subscribe button right now. So, until next week, once again, this is Bill Chase quoting a wise Hamiltonian. When I tell ya, don't you dare miss it. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Wrestling Fan with Bill Chase. If you'd like to make a contribution to the show, just make sure you vote for Tyler Arrow next time he's in a Brad Michaels lookalike contest.